One of the most impactful battles in the Cincinnati Bengals training camp is Dax Hill and DJ Turner as the Bengals try to find their second starting outside corner. Let's break down what's happened through three days of training camp practices. You are Locked On Bengals, your daily Cincinnati Bengals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, Bengals fans, and welcome to another episode of the Locked On Bengals podcast. I'm your host, Jake Lisko. He's your host, James Rapine. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network here on Locked On Bengals, covering your team every day, everywhere you get your podcasts, and on YouTube. If you're new to the show, you can join the everydayers and all of you out there that make us your first listen and shout out to those regular groups by just subscribing to the podcast, and then you'll get those notifications every time we put an episode up. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, and they're hooking up all customers this summer with a boost or bonus daily. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long at FanDuel.com. And James, we've talked about this cornerback battle for, I don't know, it feels like forever, probably a few weeks. We've really been doing our training camp previews, talking about training camp. We've been talking about Dax Hill, DJ Turner, and with Cam Taylor Britt's absence from practice as he recovers from getting his tonsils out, those two guys have had a ton of time on the field at the same time. And you can see the direct at the same time they're competing, not having to rotate or anything like that while Cam Taylor Britt gets healthy. Yeah, it's it's one of the, the blessings, I would say. You get both of these guys that are clearly competing against each other for one starting job and you get them out there and you get them a ton of reps and a ton of reps against a variety of different players. It's unfortunate because you're not seeing both guys deal with the Jamar Chase or T. Higgins on a regular basis. They have had to face T some. But still, Jermaine Burton, Andre Yosevash, uh, Charlie Jones, all these guys, they're different. And so whether it's a guy like DJ Turner, who I, I think is trying to show the Bengals that he can be physical enough at the catch point specifically, to to be that starting cornerback or a guy in Daxo who's trying to make the transition from safety to corner, that alone, the extra snaps, the extra reps, uh, comfort level, I think that it's good for that for both guys. And, and we could talk about both guys individually a little bit. Let's start uh, with Dax, just because he's making the switch and where's his comfort level. I think he is pretty comfortable at corner. It doesn't mean he's not going to get beat. I can see the social media uh, posts now. Just I, I've seen them. People are, are monitoring that. Look, he's going to get beat some. Guess what? DJ Turner's gotten beat in this camp too. DJ Turner has been far from a lockdown corner in this camp because cornerbacks get beat, and, and that's okay. You just need to make sure that Dax is learning from the double move he gave up to, to Jermaine Burton or learning uh, from losing to Shedrick Jackson deep downfield uh, on the – I think it was a few plays later on Thursday. And outside of those two plays, it hasn't been a lot of deep stuff and uh, hasn't gotten beat often. So I, I do think that Dax has fared pretty well and is comfortable at corner. They're such different players stylistically. And that would make sense, right? DJ Turner, a slightly undersized corner or just an undersized corner, depending on your definition of slight. And Dax Hill, who is a former safety. And he was a little bit small for a safety, but for a corner, that's pretty good size on Dax Hill. Both guys have great athleticism, very high level movement ability that they have in common. I think DJ Turner's probably a little bit better right now with the ball in the air in man coverage or, or in a man on man situation where you have to get your head around, find the ball. I think he's a little bit more advanced there right now. Not that Dax doesn't have ball skills. We've seen that from him before, but it's typically from a, a different angle, a different vantage point when you're playing safety versus when you're maybe on a receiver's hip and trying to track the receiver rather than playing a center field responsibility. So obviously some differences there, but the, the biggest difference between these players is the physicality with which they play. Dax, a guy that doesn't lack for physicality at all. You've seen it with the way he's, defended tight ends in cornerback on tight end or safety on tight end matchups in the past when he's gotten aligned on wide receivers in the past he has played emergency corner for this team 
in the past. So we have that tape to refer to as well. And generally speaking, Dax is a pretty sticky guy in coverage. He's generally on a player's hip. And it's just, can he get that next step of either improving his play at the catch point, either in getting his head around or in being more consistent with forcing a few more incompletions with that physical play at the catch point. Meanwhile, DJ Turner, it's a similar question at the catch point as you, as you highlighted, but also can he improve his hand usage at the line of scrimmage and throughout the route? And that's something that we'll need to see throughout camp is can he stay more attached to receivers throughout their route? And then, you know, there's clips out there of him trying to play strong at the catch point, And then Andre Yosevas just out muscles him. And that's going to happen to everyone at some point. It's not an indictment of DJ Turner. He's also had more pass breakup clips than anyone else I've seen so far on social media. So he's had his ups as well. And, and this isn't meant to be a pro Dax anti DJ Turner segment, if that's the general no. thing, because DJ Turner has had, I think, a, a pretty solid set of plays to go with the continued areas where he needs to improve. Yeah, there's there's no doubt about that. I think DJ's had the more more highlight plays and hasn't given up the the big plays. I just mentioned the two big plays that Dax mm -hmm. has given up. The Burton one's a touchdown, probably. Maybe Geno Stone gets there and, and pushes him out of bounds in, in, in real life action or live action. I I don't know though. He might not have. Because Jermaine Burton had, had clear separation, had to wait on the ball a little bit from Browning, which is normal just from a timing standpoint, that everything isn't necessarily in line and, and still was able to make the catch. What I will say is that I I think that Dax, and he had a play when we were talking. When you mentioned Andre, and and on, we've seen the the clip of Andre where DJ's helmet comes off and Andre somehow still holds onto the ball as they're landing on the back shoulder. Plays like that, I do think Dax is pretty comfortable in. Andre had a, a catch like that on the sideline during the offseason program. And right in the last second where it looked like it was obviously a catch, Dax knocked it away. And, and so that's good to see it reminded me of that like all right well from a strength physicality standpoint he does have that and so it's just a matter of can you clean up the the double move stuff probably and that's technique stuff that isn't physically able to run with jermaine it's he, also he's, something he's that gets every that. corner from time to time it's not no like it's not, there's no corner in the nfl immune to a double move and and that's what's tough when when you say like i mentioned the social media clips earlier it's like oh noted this guy got beat it's like yeah every guy gets beat so we can't just panic the moment that happens that's part of life in the nfl's a corner you know who's going to get beat when he comes back at some point cam taylor Britt is going to get beat and he's going to give up a big play it doesn't mean he's not a good corner mike hilton at times gets beat by the way had a really nice play since we're talking about corners on mike gasicki on friday where he uh mike gasicki tried to uh, out muscle him and where the ball was and Mike was able to say hey five nine men thriving right now at training camp uh, that being said shout out to Mike Hilton I, I think that this cornerback battle is it, it isn't someone's going to win by default I think both guys have showed had their fair share of nice plays Dax Hill had a pass breakup in the red zone on Friday Friday I'm trying to get my days right it's really tough Gene but on Friday so that's good. We'll see what happens on Sunday night. We're recording this, obviously, before the Sunday night practice. Uh, weird timing there. If anything uh, crazy happens, we'll have you covered. But overall, this cornerback battle, I think it's a good start for both guys. And coming into camp, I thought it was going to go down to the wire, down to the final preseason game, down to the final few days of camp, uh, and, and preseason final days of being able to evaluate these guys. I feel the exact same. Essentially, one weekend, three practices in for. Dax Hill and DJ Turner. Yeah, those joint practices in the preseason games that mm -hmm. these guys participate in are going to tell us a lot more than the first few days of training camp. But as this is one of the biggest battles of Cincinnati Bengals training camp, it made sense to do a little review over three days because as James mentioned, we're recording this before back together Sunday's practice, which is quite late. And we wanted to get a show to you guys uh, in, in a timely fashion. One other quick note on the secondary, James, is that it has been clear that Von Bell has been getting reps with the ones at safety. We will continue to monitor that if there is more of a rotation brewing there where Jordan Battle is getting a little bit more run. But for now, it seems like Von Bell is getting the snaps with the starters. And that is the other update there on the secondary. 
I guess another update on the secondary is the Bengals did sign a corner, despite Duke Tobin's comments. They signed two UFL players and a third mm. punter. Let's get mm. into those player acquisitions coming up next. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. I love sports. I love them so much. I never want them to stop. And right now, well, there isn't much going on outside of, wait, the Olympics, outside of Major League Baseball, outside of NFL futures bets. The point is, is there's never a downtime for FanDuel. And that's why all summer long, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone all summer long with FanDuel. Maybe you want to get in on the Olympics because you think LeBron James and Steph Curry and Team USA is going to handle business and win gold. Maybe you don't. Maybe you're going to go against America. No. Maybe you think it's going to be one of these other teams that are really, really talented. Well, you can wager on that and so much more with FanDuel. So whether it's Cincinnati Reds, whether it's Bengals Futures, whether it's the Summer Olympics, head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. Again, that is FanDuel.com. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. The Bengals made three moves. In the time between our most recent podcast and this podcast, James, they signed UFL standout wide receiver tight end Hakeem Butler, who will technically be a, I think, third year NFL player, but has been around for a while now between the NFL and the uh, the spring leagues. They signed Nate Brooks, a cornerback, and they signed Ryan Reckow, a punter, BYU punter, a rookie, got a draftable grade. We'll talk about all three of these guys. There are now three draftable punters, though, on this team from the last two draft classes, which is fascinating. But Hakeem Butler, probably the most notable of these guys. It, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me when I heard they were working him out because you're trying to find where he fits in on this roster with the depth of tight end, with the depth of wide receiver. But they go ahead and sign him and add depth there and a, a relatively unique body type in terms of receiving weapon in Hakeem Butler, who is very productive in the UFL. Yeah, I I think it's interesting. Is is this the the Mike Gesicki backup? And I don't mean that strictly as as it sounds. I don't think he's replacing Tanner Hudson or Drew Sample or Eric All or Tanner McLaughlin or any of these guys. But can he do some of the stuff that Mike Gesicki can do? Or is this as simple as, all right, well, we had three open roster spots. He's productive. Let's bring him in. Let's see what he's got. It might be that simple. But I do think it's interesting. And what I would say is he clearly is, is just much leaner than any of the tight ends they have, including Gitsicki. Just leaner. And that makes sense. He played wide receiver at the UFL level and was really, really good. I sent a message to Kyle Kasky when they were working him out. He coached him with the Battle Hawks. And he was like, oh, yeah, this kid is – He's got NFL talent, can run well enough, and can certainly uh, has the size and ability to make plays. All right, so we'll see. But it's it's interesting that they they went this route where tight end is kind of a position, I would say, of strength because of the depth and the the potential upside and Eric All potentially coming back in the near future. And and so how does Akeem Butler fit in? I don't know. It's interesting. I don't know if he would have fit in in the wide receiver room either. So I, I get listing him as a tight end and trying him there. And who knows? Maybe maybe it is as simple as, all right, well, he can be this guy that maybe you develop and teach tight end skills to. And then if anything happens to Mike Gesicki, he's someone that can do some of those things that you're asking Mike to do where you're not completely changing the offense. Because there's something size-wise that, that Mike can do that those other tight ends can't in the red zone, for example. And so maybe that's that's their vision here for a key. It still seems unlikely that any of these players make the roster, guys that are signed because they're young free agents who have bounced around the NFL that get signed you know, in the first week or so of training camp. It's a very uphill battle for those guys. I don't want to write them off by any means. That's not what I'm trying to do here, but it, it does seem to be a tough battle for any of these guys to find a roster spot, but Hakeem Butler does bring that, you know, 6'5", 227, I think is, is where he's listed. Mm -hmm. So a very big dude who 
in the UFL had back to back 130 plus yard games with two touchdowns in week five and week six of UFL action went for 710 yards in I think 11 games, five touchdowns, pretty good numbers in the UFL, which is obviously a step of competition down uh, from the NFL, but Hakeem Butler has kicked around the NFL for a while. The challenge for NFL teams has been, where does this guy play? And and that's where you look at the overlap from a size perspective between him and Gusecki, between Gusecki being a, a big wide receiver who's going to rarely be in line to the way Hakeem Butler was recently used in the UFL, where he's a big wide receiver who is rarely used in line, but he did actually have some in-line tight end snaps in the UFL, just not very many, less than Mike Kosecki would have, for example. But uh, I do wonder if that is a developmental plan there. It'll be very interesting to see how he does throughout this training camp, see if he sticks around uh, after training camp in some capacity. They also signed Nate Brooks, a corner, this will be most likely a depth move. Do you have any other significant thoughts on Nate Brooks? My my one tidbit on Nate Brooks is that his last NFL game was actually against the Cincinnati Bengals in January 2021, late in the 2020 season, playing for the Baltimore Ravens. So the last time he played in the NFL, it was against the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, he also played a lot of special teams in the UFL. So maybe there's that aspect with the kickoff changing. Um, any thoughts there? Yeah. He played in the Tua Bowl, the tank for Tua Bowl, Bengals, Dolphins. Oh, there you go. In, in 2019. And uh, it was called that, by the way, at the time. Like going into that game, it was the tank for Tua Bowl. Obviously, things changed a bit. And that was really the Burrow Bowl. And deep down, the Bengals probably already knew. But uh, yeah, that was a, a big game. And shout out to Jay Morrison for this. I think they they asked him, they caught up with him and asked him, hey, what do you remember from that game? And he said, and I haven't heard this, but Jay said it, so I'm going to say it, especially because of who he's talking about. He said, just remember John Ross running go routes. <laughs> remember <laughs> John Ross running go routes in that game. Uh, which That was such a wild game, by the way. The Bengals end up forcing overtime. Tyler Boyd picks himself up off the turf. Eifert scores. Andy Dalton says, hey, you're not going to get my replacement with the number one pick uh, only for that to happen anyway. So, uh, yeah, it was a wild game. I'm glad the Bengals lost that game. I know the Bengals were glad they, were, they lost that game. And it, it's funny that he's a piece of uh, piece of Bengals history, a piece of Joe Burrow coming to Cincinnati. Feels like an eternity ago with those names, but really wasn't all that long ago. It feels like a lot. Like we're getting to the point, like COVID made it weird where time yeah. – Felt like it yeah. stood still and it was like, oh, that really wasn't that long ago. It's starting to feel really long ago now. Yeah. I mean, we're talking five years now but that we're pushing. So yeah. the Bengals uh did also sign Ryan Reckow, BYU punter, who, according to the punt runs, puntalytics, my my favorite draft and NFL punt analytics Twitter account, had a had a draftable grade on him. He was right there with PFF grade with Austin McNamara. In his last year in college, the big difference between those guys from a statistical perspective is Reckow averaged two additional yards per punt with a little bit less hang time, a greater percentage of his kicks returned. So perhaps a little bit more power there in terms of raw power than any of the other punters on the roster, but perhaps in need of finding some control. But interesting to bring in a third punter for a competition that we already thought was going to be pretty tight between McNamara and Brad Robbins, James. Yeah, I think my first thought was, and I, I haven't seen him. Obviously, we're recording this on Sunday morning. Is, is everyone healthy? Is everyone okay? Seems like that. That's okay. And so more competition, and that's fine. Like competition is good. I know Brad Robbins is welcoming it. I'm sure Austin McNamara is confident in his abilities. So how that balances out is interesting. But I'm not going to argue with that. You know what I'm going to argue with? Settling. If that's what it meant, if if maybe they they have some reservations about McNamara, reservations about how Robbins has uh, done this offseason. So I want these guys with their best foot forward, literally, so we don't have to talk about punters in the middle of the season because they're punting at a high level. So hopefully that is the case. We'll see if that's the case, but uh, I'm excited to watch a three-way only in Cincinnati, right? 
on her battle <laughs> in training camp. You mean, Up next, you mean oh. for Joe Burrow? Come on. That's right. That's true. Four. Yeah. See, but I don't get the point. I, I stick with the three way. You don't need yeah. to add onions to something that yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I agree. You don't need to add beans to something that beautiful. You know what? You do need to add a giant 6'8 alien named Amarius Mims uh, at right tackle. We will get to the Bengals' first rounder and other practice notes from the first week coming up next. Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace for Major League Baseball, which means if you're hanging out at the banks, you know, oh, and the Reds are in town this week, by the way. Wow. Let's go to the Reds game. Well, if you have the Game Time app downloaded, you can take advantage of their zone deals, of their last minute deals, of all of the awesome things that come with having the Game Time app. You get views from your seat, and it makes buying Major League Baseball tickets that easy. And it's not just MLB tickets. No, no, no. Maybe you're thinking, going on the road to watch the Bengals this year, coming to Cincinnati to watch the Bengals. Game Time is going to have the tickets for you. You have panoramic views from your seat. You know exactly what you're getting, all in pricing. And every event that you're thinking about going to, any event that you're thinking about going to, whether it's a concert this summer, whether it's Major League Baseball, whether it is the Big Three, which is coming here, by the way, Ice Cube's Basketball League, Game Time is going to have it for you. So download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N NFL for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Amarius Mims has been running with the ones, which is great for him. We're still waiting to find out when Trent, Trent Brown will return. You talked to Trent Brown on Friday, James. So we have a little update for you there from James's perspective, having talked to the man himself. But let's start there, and then we'll dive into what we've seen from Amarius Mims over a, uh, not a week. I was going to say a week. The first three days of padless practices in Cincinnati. It's week training. one. Yeah. Yeah. Week one, you know, week one, whatever you want to say. But yeah, I, as far as Trent, I think this kind of coincides with what we expected, what we thought. He's fine health wise. I don't think it's like, I don't think he's perfectly healthy, right? I think he's working through some stuff. Zach Taylor mentioned tightness, but I don't think it's a big concern. Put it that way. When I say fine, like long term evaluation, fine, going to be okay, not a concern there. And when he's out there for practice, I think they're taking it slow with him. Obviously, Trey Hendrickson taking it slow with him. They're doing it with a lot of veterans. And a guy like Trent Brown with his injury history makes a ton of sense. Ease him in, get him with the uh, the strength coaches and, and, and the, the staff there. And when do you need him? You need him September 8th. And, and I think they know that. What, what I'll say about Trent, he's, he's such a – he just seems really easy going, really chill. And uh, I, I, I do think he's going to fit locker room wise. You do need to get him out there and, and get him comfortable. And, and I think they will. I think we'll see him activated. I don't want to put a timeline on it. Wouldn't shock me if it's in the near future. Also, wouldn't shock me if it's the week of the preseason game, so a week from now. Uh, but I, I do think it's coming in the near future. I would like to see you walking across the street with Amarius Mims and Trent Brown and Zach Moss. Because then we'd have the extra I, reference point there. Yeah, I would. I, me and Zach Moss would just look pretty, pretty similar. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Which is news. complimenting me, by the way, not making fun of Zach Moss for those wondering. Yeah, uh, good news there for Trent Brown if he is indeed dealing with some minor things. Getting him back on the field sooner than later would obviously be preferable. But the guy's been around for what ten years in the NFL now. He's he's yeah. Getting to be a little bit long in the tooth. Very experienced, though. In, nice in and slow. Of, Take it nice and slow with Trent. Yeah, and, and this, you're right, has been the approach for many veterans on this team, uh, especially early in camp when they're doing the three days on, one day off. The start of the Bengals training camp schedule this year is a little bit more aggressive than the remainder of training camp in terms of uh, amount of time on task versus rest days. They're three on, one off, three on, one off for the first eight days of, of camp, and then they're two on, one off. Uh, after that for essentially the, the rest of training camp until we get to a, a more regular season schedule down the road. So especially when there are compared to the rest of camp, some extra practices in there 
early in camp when there's a ramp up period where you want to avoid those lower extremity soft uh, soft tissue injuries, the hamstring injuries, the calf injuries, et cetera. It makes sense to to go slow with these guys and make sure that you're you're taking care of them as best you can. But in lieu of Trent Brown playing right tackle, we've seen Amarius Mims playing right tackle and the rookie, I think, has acquitted himself pretty well, James, from what I've seen. In in terms of pass protection, especially, which is yep. kind of where things start with this team. I think he's looked pretty good going against Sam Hubbard. It sounds like Sam Hubbard got him once on Friday with a little bit of an inside move move. Did. Uh, H- Hubbard said, uh told Jeff Hobson at least that uh Mims just overset a little bit. And you see that for every tackle at some point. But You've also seen Hubbard try to go through Amarius Mims or try to go around Amarius Mims, and that doesn't go well for Sam Hubbard. Not that Sam Hubbard is a bad player, but uh, when you try to go through or around Amarius Mims, he's really good at stopping you from doing that, and that has been apparent as well from some of the early returns. Look at you. Just trying to find ways to take shots at Sam Hubbard any way you can. You know he's from here. You know, I mean, can you just give him? No, I'm just kidding. Oh, let's not I'm perpetuate kidding. this further, James. Oh, man. Jake Lisko, the Sam Hubbard hater. My oh, God. no. Lord. I'm Wait. excited for Sam Hubbard this year. I am, too. If he's 2022 Sam Hubbard, that's going to be a huge boost for this defense. Look, he's awesome. I think, I think Amarius Mems, you, you see it. You see it translating. And Willie Anderson saw it firsthand. Yeah. Uh, you went back and watched some clips, and, and it's there. You're right. I remember the play because... I was the one that confirmed it. The writers were like, hey, because it, it, it got blown dead for some reason. There was a, I forget why it was blown dead. Um, or maybe it was just a bad play, so I, I was going to delete it or bad shot by me. But I was able to get that clip, and he did. He hit him outside, Mims overset, came back inside and was able to get to Joe or get closer uh, to Joe. I think Joe got rid of it. But the point being that – those moments have have been few and far between so far. There, there haven't been a ton. And that doesn't mean he's been perfect. There's been other times where he's been beat. But that's part of life in the NFL. It's similar to the corner thing that, that we were talking about earlier and the logic with that. What I will say is not only does he look the part we knew that, but the footwork is there. It, it, and it, it, it technically, like all of the the traits that you're looking for to translate, they're there. It's about refining them now and getting used to life in the NFL and getting more experience, which is why Trent Brown not being out there right now isn't a big concern for me, for Trent or for Amarius. It's good to get Amarius as many reps, as many valuable reps as possible. And just talking to people in the building, because you remember pre-draft, it was like, oh, yeah, Mims, what up? Uh, you know, I, people were acting like his attitude was just awful, his work ethic would be bad. And, and, and some of that vibe, I think, impacted him falling to number 18. No one in the building has said anything like that. And I've asked a lot because my initial impression with Amarius is, oh, he gets it. And so is he fooling me or is that how he's approaching it when I'm not around and when there aren't eyes on him? And talking with people that I do trust, he's been bought in. He's working really hard. He's made major strides from the draft through the offseason program, from the offseason program to now, which is really, really exciting, I think for the Bengals and certainly for Joe Burrow and for fans and for, for everybody involved. Yeah. You talk about the, the technical aspect of his play to go along with the work ethic that you've just described. And to me, the technique looks pretty good and, and haven't seen a ton yet. And I'm excited to get down there and see him in person and get to focus on him a little bit more, hopefully in some of the team drills. But from what I can tell the, the kicks, the kick slides that the past sets still look really good to me, those look really good at Georgia. He stays balanced. He has very quick feet. And I'm not even qualifying that with for a man of his size. Like his feet as a tackle are just good. He's he's under control and moves explosively in short areas. And and the length shows up, the power shows up. Yeah. And what he described as where he needs to, to continue his growth is he needs to continue to improve his consistency. And that's where you talk about things like oversetting, recognizing pass rush plans from opposing pass rushers. And, you know, this obviously matters more on a week to week basis where you're not going against the same guys every single day and you have to prepare for what, you know, 
TJ Watt is going to prepare for you this week and how, how, how that will be stylistically different from a Bosa or whatever the, the pass rusher is in question, right? Whatever elite pass rusher the Bengals are playing uh, on a given week, a Zadaria Smith with, with the Cleveland Browns will be another matchup that'll face miles Garrett as well, who will move around a little bit, but besides the point it's, it's that, you know, and then it'll be preparing week to week for those different plans. And then it's, he, he mentioned it speed of the game. And, and that'll be the other big adaptation for him. He credited Georgia with getting him ready for, from a camp intensity perspective. Like he's been able to keep up and, and Georgia did a good job preparing him for the, the uh, strain, let's say, or, or strenuousness of, of NFL camps. And maybe it's even not as hard as a Georgia camp was hard to say. Uh, yeah. But I think that the early returns are positive for Mims. And and I guess my question is, is can he win that job? Is it yep. more realistic that he's going to win that job today than it was a month ago? Yes. Yes. Because, because if he continues to show growth and improvement and Trent isn't out there at some point, yeah, that becomes a thing. And, and, and the, the question is when? When does it, and I think it's a competition, but when does it become a thing where Mims can take the lead? And I don't yeah. think it's yet. I still don't think it's now. But if you get into preseason game number one and then preseason game number two and Mims like wins a lot of those joint practice reps, outperforms Brown when when both guys are out there, then we're, then we're having a real discussion. And so that, that's a ways away still. But uh, I think he's off to a good start. I think he has the right mindset, and I'm I'm excited. He's one of my targets this week to to chat with, and um, he's he's been popular. Anytime I've rolled by the the rookie locker room, he's he's been busy chatting with with different reporters. So my goal is to to track down Amarius this week and chat with him. Yeah, got to get the uh, the pads on as well for from an observation perspective. It makes such a difference. He, he's not going to practice in pads. He's too big. They too big. they don't have pads. They don't have pads that fit him or Trent. So yeah, they're going padless. It's wild. Yeah, it's crazy. People are going to believe that if we don't tell them that, that <laughs> it was a joke. He'll be in pads and so will Trent when he's uh, out. All right. We've got uh, a practice tonight that we will not have covered for you until tomorrow. So it, unless something wild happens. Unless something really noteworthy happens. Yeah. Obviously, we'll track it everywhere. If If we need to return with breaking analysis and reactions to back together weekends late night practice we will do so but for now this will get you through until after monday's practice barring something unforeseen between now and then if you need something else to listen to between now and then you can check on the locked on sports today 24 7 streaming channel on your amazon fire tv or on youtube and until next time that's going to do it for this episode of the locked on bengals podcast thanks for listening who day and have a good one